Hello IB Environmental students, today we're going to be talking all about eutrophication. Alright, let's jump in. So as we begin, we need to understand that eutrophication to a certain degree is a very natural process. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's just part of succession and succession is going from a disturbance and changing over time the ecosystem and what's there. So this eutrophication that's natural is the natural changing and aging of a body of water. So over time a big lake or stream will end up getting sediment and that sediment will fill with dead and decaying organisms and debris and will slowly fill up to be a marsh and eventually a meadow. That's natural eutrophication, all right? So the more nutrients that enter the system, the more organisms might live or die, and they'll end up adding up, and we'll get more organic molecules and sediment decaying and recycling, filling up the lake or stream, and eventually we'll get a new, non-very watery meadow over time. Pretty crazy. So overall, the bodies of water will naturally change. The part that is at the beginning um, is called oligotrophic, meaning low nutrients, lots of oxygen. At the end, we call it eutrophic, where there was high nutrients, low oxygen. So this would be a really great thing to maybe have a really brief drawing of. Um, but the big idea is that when we are eutrophic, we have a lot of nitrates and phosphates and things that would help plants grow, all right? But because there's so much growth and also recycling of those nutrients, they're also depleting the oxygen. And we're going to learn how that's possible. A more kind of healthy, stable lake is going to be the oligotrophic lake. It's a lot more stable, and we're going to see why in a second. Um, unfortunately, this natural eutrophication process is sped up by cultural eutrophication. Um, we, accelerate, we accelerate that nutrients that end up into the lake or the stream or even Chesapeake Bay. And we do that by adding nitrates and phosphates in many different ways. They can be coming in from our detergents, accidental discharge of sewage, yuck, and especially fertilizers from big agricultural runoff, but even fertilizers from our lawns if we accidentally put it on right before a rainstorm. So we have to really think about, as we're thinking about solutions later, how we could lower this nutrient or nitrate and phosphate input because those are the things that accelerate this process and make it so that there's too many nutrients and ohm, and then eventually low oxygen in a lake. And I don't know about you, but that sounds quite bad to have low oxygen. Organisms can't survive with that. And to describe those situations, we have these two terms, BOD and DO, that we have briefly mentioned before, but let's go over them again. BOD is biological oxygen demand. Remember that BOD is really referring to the bacterial decomposers that use up the oxygen as they break down dead and decaying matter. So as things die, these guys are recyclers, and as they recycle doing that job, they take oxygen out of the water area. So how much they're really stealing oxygen from the water as they do their decomposition and recycling, that's called BOD. This is going to increase as we have more nutrients and more dead and decaying matter, as we have more bacteria as well. So if there's a lot of bacteria in a stream, if there's a lot of nitrates in the stream, that means there's going to be a lot of BOD because these guys are going to be increasing, increasing, increasing their use of the oxygen. This is oxygen stealing from the lake or stream. This is almost the opposite of DO, how much dissolved oxygen is actually available to the other organisms in the water. This is really important for their survival breathing. All right, so if there's a lot of bacteria and a lot of nutrients staking oxygen from the water, this is going to be lower. So they're inversely related, and we will review this in class because it's quite hard. But as we think about especially cultural eutrophication, it goes through a couple of steps, and we're going to practice this also in class. So the big idea is nutrients cause the BOD to increase and the DO to decrease. Let's talk about how in steps. The nutrients that could be from fertilizer, nitrates, and phosphates, they're going to cause plants to be able to 
say we because remember it's fertilizer plants love fertilizer and algae is plant like and they're gonna bloom all right and later they're gonna die all right and usually they die because they have less sunlight decomposers right they're going to use up oxygen as they break down the dead and decaying algae and they're stealing oxygen then from all the other organisms in the lake or stream. So as the oxygen levels deplete, the other organisms cannot breathe and the DO gets lower. So the whole problem is we cause too many things to get alive temporarily. They die and that causes the decomposers to steal oxygen from everything else. Pretty sad. What does this seem like? Because this is going to cause even more death and even more decomposition. Does it seem like a positive or negative feedback loop? It's definitely positive, and hopefully you could explain why. Because it's a very unstable equilibrium going further and further away from our natural state of having enough oxygen for things to survive and be stable. So what are the overall impacts of eutrophication? We've already said this, it lowers the dissolved oxygen and therefore things can't really survive. Um, this is going to cause all the organisms that are aerobic needing oxygen, they're going to die because of the low DO. And we see that especially and get really freaked out as humans when we see large amounts of fish show up on the uh, beaches and streams. Um, and that is a big sign that the area is doing very poorly. Uh, we also see that turbidity increases. Algae blooms cause those decomposers to make a cloudy water. That low sunlight causes even more dead matter and even more eutrophication. And overall, we're going to see biodiversity go down and changes to the food chain. When the fish disappear, that's going to disrupt stuff. Eventually, our little creatures are not going to do so well because only if they can deal with the low oxygen will they survive and overall our ecosystem stability drops. So that being said we have to think about ways of maybe dealing and managing with this pollutant. So we would use our pollution management three categories to deal with this. So there's three major categories. This is the first and usually the best option. Just let's first off prevent or replace the pollutant by altering human activity. This looks like, for instance, on farmland, we could just use organic techniques. Maybe we won't use as much or any fertilizer, or we won't use the synthetic ones that are really high in nitrates and phosphates. We could also just try different techniques to reduce the runoff of nitrates and phosphates into the water. Just don't even let them get into the water in the first place. This looks like picking up feces, all right? Not with your bare hands, of course, but dog poo, especially people leave that out and about. It's really gross. I don't want to step in it, but it's full of nutrients, and that is going to cause eutrophication. So now the next time you see your neighbor not pick up their dog poo, you could say you're killing the Chesapeake Bay because you are causing eutrophication. Be careful when you fertilize your lawn. No need to do it too often and definitely don't do it when it's about to rain because it's all going to just wash off. We can also think about porous concrete. That's going to allow for less impervious surface and runoff and that will allow the water to sink into the ground rather than rushing into a stream. This is very expensive though. A cheaper set of options, but it is tough to set up initially, are rain barrels that catch water, which would reduce runoff in general, as well as rain gardens, which reduce runoff as well too. The next best option would be if we can't seem to stop adding the nutrients like nitrates and phosphates and letting them into the water, well, at least we should put some legislation and figure out ways to reduce them in general. Um, and so this usually looks like governmental organizations m setting limits, like the EPA or Environmental Protection Agency has an amount of safe nitrates. And so they will regularly monitor the areas, even places like Akatank, where they're worried the nitrate levels could be getting too high and could be unsafe. So they will also monitor effluent coming out of different factories or areas to ensure compliance with those regulations. Effluent means areas that it's exiting the area, a flow or a transfer of water. 
Um, this is really difficult though, because in general we consider eutrophication um, a really non-point source pollutant problem because it's really hard to track exactly who, which farmer has the fertilizer that's causing or excess feces on their property that's causing the problem and may, that makes it so that we can't really find people really easily. Um, we could also try to treat the area of the of the the runoff or effluent before it even gets into the water system, especially making sure we treat our sewage and wastewater if possible as best as we can before releasing it back into our water systems. We don't want any remaining nutrients in from the our poop, our human poop going into the water. That's quite gross. All right, this is hard. It's costly more than the other stuff in our initial option of just changing our behavior in the first place. Um, but it is the next best thing. A lot of people don't like this. It gets controversial because it's governmental control. Um, last but not least, we could have um, also monitoring of the soil and not just the water and trying to make sure that fertilizers are being used properly. Certain areas of the um, world uh, do have regulations on how much and how fertilizers are used and how our soil is being conserved. So we could relate this to soil conservation. Last slide. Um, the worst option, but it's still an option, is if it's already the the lake is already eutrophic the bay is already eutrophic we could try to clean up and restore it afterwards but the damage is kind of already done and this is a very expensive option um, this could look like taking um, big machinery and dredging the sediment removing it this looks like picking up lots of the dead and decaying matter from the bottom of the body of water so that it doesn't start to decompose and the biological oxygen demand doesn't increase that's really expensive you're gonna to have to find a place to put that material um, you could try to add more plants to try to increase the biological oxygen demand um, this is adding especially underwater grasses so photosynthesis increased and we can try to if their fish have died breed the fish and add them this is very hard and things still could die and it was really expensive and really hard. So the best of the options is always just to initially reduce and alter our activity instead of cleaning up afterwards. Preventative is always better. All right, good job guys.